Hi, I'm Dr. Jack West. I'm Associate Clinical Professor in Medical Oncology at the City of Hope Comprehensive Cancer Center and also the founder and president of GRACE, Global Resource for Advancing Cancer Education. I'm very happy to be joined today for an ASCO Highlights presentation in the field of lung cancer with two of my friends and colleagues from other parts of the country who are lung cancer experts with uh, some different perspectives and we're going to go through some of the key presentations and uh, talk about what we think this means for patients. Uh, so uh, first I have uh, Dr. Helena Yu, who is a medical oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and Dr. David Spiegel, who is chief scientific officer and director of the lung cancer program at the Sarah Cannon Cancer Center in Nashville, Tennessee. Thanks guys for joining. Let's turn to mesothelioma, uh, cancer of the lining around the lung where chemotherapy typically is platin and olympto or pemetrexid is a standard of care. Sometimes carboplatin replaces the cisplatin and who are not great uh, candidates for the cisplatin. And sometimes we add Avastin, the anti by, uh, angiogenic or blocking the blood supply agent uh, along with the chemotherapy. There was a European study that showed a benefit, but it isn't FDA approved for that. It's not uh, extremely widely used. Uh, immunotherapy has been looked in uh, this setting in previously treated patients with uh, mesothelioma after chemo and in trials like this, a, a little bit of data concurrent with uh, chemotherapy. And here, this was a study of 55 patients in the U.S. presented by our colleague Patrick Ford at Johns Hopkins. And uh, so it was cisplatin pemetrexid with dervalumab infinzi and then maintenance dervalumab. And we see a median survival that uh, is encouraging at 20.4 months. That, again, median meaning half the patients are alive and half have died by that time. For context in the larger phase three studies, such as with, uh, with bevacizumab, you tend to get around or just beyond a year and a half. So it's in that ballpark, but we also tend to see better results in these smaller studies uh, than larger ones. So hard to get a sense of whether this is anything meaningful. Uh, and I'm interested, Helena, can you give your thoughts about how uh, provocative these are to you? Do you think this is likely to translate to any change in management or is this comparable to what we can get every day with the tool we already have? I think exactly as you said, I think with a phase two study, it really is hard to make any definitive statements. Um, you know, the DREAMER study is already looking at uh, this combo in the phase three setting in a randomized uh, chemo versus chemo plus trivalumab. So I think um, that um, should be definitive uh, in a way that this one was not. Um, and then I think the other thing to, I think to note in, in talking about it with some of the other abstracts we discussed, um, there was um, sort of a notice from BMS that the IPINEVO study here uh, was a positive study for whatever that means. And so I think another kind of challenge um, with the way that data comes out is, you know, will there be a, a different standard um, and how to sort of do that sort of cross trial comparison. So I think that'll be um, an interesting challenge. We'll look forward to the IPINEVO data. And uh, David, how optimistic are you about this line of work? Is, is this exciting to you or do you think this is relatively less so for a phase two study. I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I think there's just, there's limited things you can say here, but um, you know, I, it's funny just today we were, <laughs> we had a chance to review Patrick's dreamer study and we discussed, you know, what would change when we, you know, when we see the Nevo IPI data. Um, and so is this, is this study going to finish? Is it going to, you know, are we going to have two options? So I guess the main thing is even with bevacizumab's advantages, what, a few years ago, we really haven't seen any real shift in the care of mesothelioma. So 
hopefully something here will work. I just don't think there's much more we can say beyond beyond what you've, you've commented on in this small study. And what do you do outside of a trial? Are you routinely incorporating Avastin, Bevacizumab if you can, or do you have mixed feelings that are not that compelled? To be honest, outside of a study, I, I just, I tend to give just platinum and uh, routinely. I mean, I don't, I don't really use Bevacizumab in that setting. And Helena, I don't know if you see very many meso patients where you are. I really don't, um, but I, I agree with uh, David that I think um, it seems like the standard for most is, is to just use the chemotherapy. Excellent. Staying on the theme of mesothelioma, uh, another trial that was uh, interesting looked at treatment after first-line therapy, and uh, this was a study that looked at chemotherapy with gemcitabine, GEMSAR, which has been around for decades and has been a kind of secondary choice for mesothelioma. Before we routinely used Olympta, Pemetrexid, GEMSAR was pretty commonly used in this setting, uh, and it tends to be well tolerated. And this was a study for patients, 164 patients included, enrolled, who had already received chemotherapy but didn't receive uh, bevacizumab, Avastin, the uh, anti, anti-angiogenic or blood vessel supply drug. And uh, patients received either gemcitabine alone or in combination with Ceramza, also known as Ramacirumab, which is another anti-angiogenic agent given IV. And uh, patients were treated with one or these two drugs until uh, progression or toxicity issues with overall survival as the primary endpoint. And here you could see the progression-free survival was nearly double in terms of median progression-free survival in the arm that got the combination, but it is not uh, statistically significant. Um, and when we look at overall survival, you can see uh, an improvement with the combination. Doesn't quite meet statistical significance, but a clear separation in these curves. And uh, when you look at the absolute difference in how many patients are alive a year in, and these were again previously treated patients, yeah, 56% more than half uh, on the combination and just a third uh, who uh, got the placebo arm of this study. And uh, interestingly, we saw that there's uh, a, a much more pronounced difference actually seen in the patients over 70. Uh, this is not a large study, so it's not large numbers of patients, but it's interesting to see that the differences are actually most pronounced in the older patients. And uh, uh, yeah, so uh, they did an analysis of a few different variables, but I don't want to get too far into the weeds when uh, you know it's not a large study. This is not likely to lead to an FDA right now for no significant difference, but how intrigued are you by this? Uh, you stated that you're not uh, necessarily enthralled by bevacizumab of Aston in the first line setting. Does this hold much merit or is this kind of more of the same and not quite enough to uh, emerge as, as a, a strong option for patients motivated for further treatment, particularly when immunotherapy may also be an option that people are thinking about, whether it's on trials or off trials in mesothelioma, where it's not FDA approved, but there's some activity there. Helena, can I start with you? Understanding that you have other people at your center who kind of eat, sleep, live, and breathe mesothelioma, and you don't? I mean, just looking at this data um, objectively as a little bit of an outsider, I mean, I think knowing mesothelioma, there really are not great second, third line options. Um, and so I think that any improvement uh, on the standard of care 
um, seems like, you know, at least a modest advance. Um, and so I think if someone were to give gemcitabine or plan on giving gemcitabine, I think it, it is reasonable um, to, to add in the remucirumab. I don't know if you would get um, sort of approval to do so at this time, but I think that the day, and I think you might not have mentioned, but it seemed like the data uh, or the benefit was irrespective of, as to whether the person got um, bevacizumab in the first line setting. So I think, um, you know, it seems like a reasonable later line option. Is this something you would push for, uh, David, or uh, really not enough? Well, I, you know, this study caught my attention. This was an odd trial, right? A small phase two study, relative uh, phase small study, but with an OS primary endpoint. So they were pretty ambitious here to, you know, pull off a positive study and they, you know, technically did that. Um, I mean, they just missed it, I guess, with the p-value, but they had a pretty nice hazard ratio. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, it's just not going to be enough to change care, but I got to tell you, off study, um, I feel better about recommending RAM here than I do in my patients with non-small cell lung cancer where it's actually approved. Really? Yeah, because the magnitude is, is greater. Well, and we don't have many good options. Yeah. I'm not sure we have tremendous <laughs> options after the chemoimmunotherapy either. But anyway, it's good to see research being done in mesothelioma yeah. and curves that are separating encouraging results. <laughs>